So today is a very special day because we have invited a guest for a topic which most of you have been waiting for. And this topic is actually dedicated to all um, low-carb and fasting practitioners who still experiences pain and other inflammation despite cutting most of their carbs. And also, of course, these are for those who are switching and transitioning to a very low-carb diet or even carnivore who experiences discomfort, especially related to oxalate dumping. So I became uh, interested with this topic myself because as you all know, uh, nakwento ko na sa inyo last year, I tried transitioning from low-carb diet to carnivore diet and I also expressed my um, experience na kung saan I have pain on my low back and other discomforts while transitioning. And that is because um, marami pa akong hindi alam noong time na yon. So I just transitioned without actually uh, learning things and <clears throat> hindi ko pa alam na merong ganitong tinatawag. So um, some of my close relatives are also diagnosed with kidney stones, which confirmed lalo that I may have oxalate sensitivity as well because it could be genetics, okay? So now who could have explained it better than the one who dedicates most of her research to oxalate? So let us all welcome here Sally Norton. Hello, Sally Norton. Good, good morning from the other side of the world. Hello, on the other side of the world. It's so exciting that we get to do this, talk to each other from the opposite end of the earth. <laughs> yes, and I'm so happy because um, like what I've said earlier, your team is very accommodating. And actually, I didn't know that you would reply. And I was so happy because this was scheduled since last month. So we found, yeah, we find <clears throat> a better schedule for this and um god really i uh, know let things happen you know because i am supposed to have my operation for my breast uh last week i have a breast cancer and this is also a very good topic to discuss with because you know if i have oxalate sensitivity i must also be aware of this because this could add up to the inflammation so sally you're also a nutritionist right and a master's in public health and how long have you been dedicating yourself to studying and researching about oxalate? Well, I didn't really understand from my background, either in nutrition or public health, that the oxalates that are in foods that we're eating and that are getting popular today mm -hmm. are actually quite impactful to whole body health, everything from the digestion, the liver, the whole vascular system, as well as the kidneys. But the, the little bit that I knew was that there you need to be on an oxalate restricted diet for kidney stones. And none of that was, I was not familiar with that. So it was in uh, originally 2019, no, 2009, when I first had a personal experience that led me to an organization here in the United States that's been teaching people about pelvic pain, particularly vulvar pain, inflammation, but just generally pelvic disorders, including interstitial cystitis and the problems that men have as well. And that would be, you know, irritable, painful bladder, frequent urination, all that. So they've been teaching this for a very long time and, and they've, they learned in their experience that conditions of pain throughout the body, joint pain, fibromyalgia type pain, all kinds of other body issues that often involve pain seem to do better in a diet that is avoiding a lot of oxalate in these foods that are, uh, some of them are really not traditional foods that people eat. Like peanuts are, it's pretty new food for human beings in the last mm -hmm. couple hundred years, but it's been adopted as a flavor element and sauces and all kinds of, it's a flexible ingredient that's been adopted all over the world. And it's really interesting when you and so you know, it was later, I did not really understand this. This is a complicated topic. And it's really a, a story of poisoning that we're eating so much of this now and we're eating it every day of the year now. We have refrigeration, we have big shipping and we have a global food supply. So things don't come and go based on the season of the year is they would normally up here in the northern hemisphere where you have quite a bit of winter time and you don't uh, necessarily eat the same foods year round but today 
we can have peanut butter, okra, potatoes, mm. these kinds of foods every day of the year because they're frozen or refrigerated or trucked in or shipped in. Uh, and so we've developed a way of eating in the last hundred years that has lost seasonality. Yes. So we I, could I would, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with that. So that actually changes our food as well because of the processing. Oh, so many elements have changed in the, in the diet with this global diet where we're eating foods that would normally have been small things just for a few weeks in the summertime or, you know, just occasional or holiday foods. And we now are now processing and commercial products so that they're, you know, less perishable crackers and cookies and snacks and chips. And these things have become a global thing to do is to like have quick food that is in a package and lasts a long time and that that really degenerates the quality of the food supply but things like fried potatoes in the forms of like chips that we have here i think people are eating that sort of packaged food it has no nutrient value and um this potatoes are an example of a high oxalate food you turn it into a snack food that has vitamins no minerals to speak of true nutrients aren't there yet it's got this toxin in there and it's sealed in with rancid oils uh and it's very starchy as well and that that's becoming okay to eat like that and this is a brand new experiment and it's increasing our odds of poisoning ourselves by having an overexposure to this one of many but this is a really special compound that is too high in certain plant foods. And we just haven't, in nutrition, we haven't paid attention that there's a certain set of vegetables, many nuts and seeds, beans, potatoes, that are so high in this stuff that we have to be very cautious about who has them and how often and how much they have, especially with children. Have you have any experience before that actually sparks your interest with oxalates? Because well, it really was my own health problems that led me here and it was uh, a long process of my health continuing to ge generate i started having problems with back pain and arthritis when i was 12. and then as i transitioned more and more to a vegetable based diet i was vegan and for eight years after eight years of being vegetarian and during those years in my 20s especially i had severe arthritis i would have rheumatism flare-ups with swelling and weakness and Sometimes it was so difficult, I could barely have the strength to turn the key in the door to get into the house. And I'm, you know, 19 years old, and I'm having that level of disability in my hands, and I had foot problems. I had to leave my um, nutrition degree program at Cornell for four years and have foot surgery. I didn't recover well from that. whole time I'm eating high oxalate foods, like Swiss chard is the one I grew up on. It's like beet greens, the tops of the, the beet. Uh, there's a version called Swiss chard that has the same plant. And spinach, the classic spinach mm -hmm. and other forms of spinach are also high in oxalate. And for me, sweet potatoes and um, Swiss chard, I had no idea that they had a level of oxalate that was something a regular person without kidney stones would have a problem with. I've never had a kidney stone, but I've had crystal urea, which is shows up as cloudy urine my whole life. I've been able to pee out a lot of oxalate in the form of these crystals that form because it comes in the body into the bloodstream as acid that then grabs minerals and forms these crystals often with calcium but it's also taking on magnesium iron and other minerals and disturbing our electrolyte balance and disturbing which is really disturbing <laughs> like you don't mess with the uh, electrolytes like the calcium ions in your blood without potentially harming the pacemaker of the heart and yes yes but in more delicate terms inside a cell little tiny ions of calcium determine how a cell is functioning and how the cell regulates its own activities it really interrupts uh cell self-regulation, mitochondrial function, cell membrane structures get damaged. The, the, there's an inversion. Phosphatidylserine is a molecule that's supposed to be on the inside. It flips to the outside of a cell because of oxalate, which tells the immune system to come take away the cell. 
you cause a lot of oxidative stress in cells and electrolyte disturbance. So because oxalate is a tiny little molecule that has an ability to get around and it tends to follow calcium in and around cells and gets into tissues high in calcium. And over time, because we're eating it so much, then so there's a beautiful picture of what's called a rapide crystal. Those are long, but tiny, tiny little toothpicks that those plants build these on purpose. So plants are making oxalic acid and turning them into this crystal, this calcium oxalate crystal for self-defense. So this is a little arrow used to defend itself. It literally can penetrate mucosal cells two cell layers deep. Um, and so if it's like, this is from Kiwi, this particular picture is from a study that looked at the rapides with Kiwi. They were studying if they painted the rapides and the oxalic acid on the leaves, would the caterpillars die, which they did. This will kill the caterpillars mm -hmm. because these, these arrows deliver the soluble oxalic acid into the bloodstream and that turns on the immune system and causes enough damage that when you're a caterpillar you die from it with us it causes irritation often we don't notice it though um, so we know from even you don't need the crystals to cause gut damage and cell, cell damage in the throat and stomach and intestinal tract because the acid itself that comes yeah. along with this also is known in certain studies like with ethylene glycol, which is another story of how you can create high oxalate in the body because the liver will turn radiator fluid, ethylene glycol coolant into oxalate in the body. And just even coolant turning into oxalic acid in the body can cause colitis, flattened villi in the intestinal tract. So you can cause digestive tract problems from the inside not just from eating it in the food, but if oxalate were to form inside the body through the biochemistry of the liver, it's still damaging to the gut lining. So gut damage is an example of the, something that is subclinical. You often don't realize it's going on and can aggravate a lot of other problems and cause you to become a hyper absorber of oxalate, which means the amount of oxalic acid that's in your spinach or your potatoes or your okra, more of it can get into the blood. So instead of 10 or 15% getting into the blood, now you could have 50 or 60%. And that's a huge increase that's very toxic. So even if you're not making a big daily staple out of one of the classic low carb things that people are using in modern times is almonds and almond flour. Yes. Oh, and that's really toxic. <laughs> it's really toxic. And if you have a little bit of leaky gut going on or gut inflammation, or you have a history of bariatric surgery, you're probably way absorbing too much oxalate, even if you're eating some more normal foods, like just a little taste of okra in your, you know, dinner. Uh, so in low carb, there's now this heavy use of cashews, peanuts, and almonds. Those are all really bioavailable, highly toxic from oxalates and other poisons in nuts. There's the dark chocolate that people think, well, I can hold on to dark chocolate if I eat, you know, 99% cacao chocolate, which is the most toxic form of chocolate. The more cacao in it, the more oxalate. Very bioavailable form of oxalate, meaning a lot of that oxalate in the chocolate gets into the bloodstream and starts causing problems, not just in your gut, but your liver, your liver is the first place where all this oxalate lands from your digestive tract. It goes through hepatic circulation. The, the liver is managing things you absorb from your food. It has a big job to do. It doesn't detox the oxalate. The liver makes more oxalate and adds more to it. But in the meantime, your liver, in order to handle all this incoming oxalic acid, is using up glutathione. Mm -hmm. And really working hard to protect itself, but can also sustain damage in your ability to now dismantle other toxins, the chemicals in your house, the chemicals at work, the electron, wherever we're getting, you know, nail polish and furniture, cleaners and whatever. The, you could start to have trouble with chemicals and start to feel headachey more and more with fragrances and things like that. That may be a sign that your liver function isn't what it should be. And it could be oxalate doing that. 
yeah oh no dark chocolate exactly <laughs> I, I, i'm actually smiling the whole time because you know what um at least it came from you because um <laughs> many people actually do not realize especially local practitioners that there could be healthy foods that contains anti-nutrients um they might think that we're so anti-plants but it's not we, we are just telling people to choose their plants very well because we have different types of sensitivities especially there are lots of anti-nutrients that plants has in order for them to protect themselves so i'm glad that you brought that up because one of the things that i also observed and things that i experienced myself when i started low carb is that we we uh lessen the carb content but um that was the time that i also um consumed spinach almonds most of our practitioners right now are are very fond of eating nuts peanuts almonds cashews and other nuts as well mm. and whenever we we tell them that it could be inflammatory um we could not really explain very well how this could be inflammatory so at least it came from you and you explained very well how this could actually affect them and damage in oxalate uh sally what are the nutrients that actually binds to oxalate well the the loss of nutrients from the minerals attaching to oxalate especially bad with calcium and magnesium mm. and iron because they they bond in a way with oxalic acid they bond together in a way that often is very difficult to come apart and even in the foods themselves Nutrition has done a very bad job of recognizing that a huge amount of what we think of as calcium in, say, spinach, is really bound up already as calcium oxalate and is not, it's not calcium at all from a nutrition point of view. It's just toxic calcium oxalate. So um, already it's lowering the minerals in the food. And then in the digestive process, it's binding minerals and lowering the amount of minerals you can get and absorb into the blood. But then what's coming into the blood is the free oxalic acid, which is now gonna clean up the minerals in your blood and in your tissue. So you're really losing a lot of minerals and you see over the long haul, devastating calcium deficiencies, iron problems, uh, other uh, macro minerals like sulfur, potassium, magnesium. And then the I believe too that the micro minerals are well are also depleted in the body. Now, the high stress of having to process a lot of oxalate tends to use up a lot of B6. And if you're low in B1, which is thiamine, you're going to have a hard time, your liver is going to have an even harder time uh, in, especially in states of inflammation, of not producing oxalate, because there's actually a little bit of production from the liver and maybe the kidneys and maybe the red blood cells a little bit of oxalic acid is made as part of our metabolism. So when we're short of the B vitamins and high in inflammation, we can produce even more. So you get what we call endogenous production as well. And so the more you've been eating too much oxalate, the more likely you're gonna have high inflammation and low B vitamins and higher endogenous production. Um, so, and it's interesting because the body is doing a lot of handling of the oxalate to try to prevent destruction of your capillaries because this is so hard on the cells and capillaries are such fragile tissues um, and the arteries are designed to be able to kind of rebuild when you get cuts and damage and you loosen capillaries the body can often rebuild them but if you're constantly eating oxalate you might damage the cells ability like there's a certain what we call plasticity in the muscle cells and the arteries and the damage from the oxalate interfering with the calcium and the oxidative balance in a cell can cause a muscle cell to act like a bone cell oh. so you know the the genetic code is like a cookbook and there's all these different recipes for how to make all these thousands of proteins and oxalate damage can cause an arterial cell to become a bone producing cell. So you get calcified arteries from the genetic damage or the, the really the metabolic damage in these cells. And it doesn't look like oxalate because it's making bone oxalate, but it's really the oxalic acid that's causing that in some cases. And this is the interesting thing about the damage that oxalate is doing to the body, how different it is in each person. And we know how dramatically different it is 
in the medical literature because there's a genetic disorder called primary hyperoxaluria where your liver, the liver in these people, often they're like cousins and things, their parents were cousins. They have very rare disease where the liver enzymes in several different ways can be wrong and they're producing a lot of oxalic acid in their metabolism. And those patients all look very different. Most of them eventually end up with severe bone problems and, you know, deformed spine because the spine bones are going and bone pain and arthritic stuff and fractures if they live long enough. Many people who are diagnosed with this are diagnosed as infants and don't live until, you know, if you're diagnosed at three months old, you probably won't be more than 14 months old before you die. If you're diagnosed at six months, you might live to be five or six years old. Some of them will survive a liver transplant and a kidney transplant and still need some dialysis help because there's this oxalate clearing from tissues that con continues to occur after you get a new liver. The new liver is not producing the oxalate, but the body is loaded with oxalate. So you see that oxalate dumping and that usually destroys the transplanted kidney in these children. So they often have to come back around and get another kidney um, if they can survive the transplant process, which is very devastating. And yet what's interesting about them is every patient is different. Every patient has different problems. Some of them have no symptoms at all until right before they die or just a neck pain. Or, And sometimes this disease doesn't show up until after something in midlife, some accident, surgery, trauma, giving birth. So there's all kinds of variants on even that. And so like in my client base, I have a lot of people who come to me after going carnivore where mm. worked for a little while or did never really work well and they felt just as bad or worse on carnivore. And others come to me after year three or four on carnivore, they felt fine for three years. And then they started oxalate dumping at year three. So you can't really always tell from a clinical picture who, how toxic a person is with oxalate. And it's really not so much about a sensitivity as it is your tolerance level may be higher if you have a really good gut and you have really great kidneys and you can put up with it for longer. But something tends to go really wrong. And it doesn't, there's not a classic way to, sh to have this show up clinically, say kidney stones. I have a client, he's been poisoning himself with spinach smoothies and healthy foods and vitamin C, which is another problem with oxalate for years and, and he's been struggling horribly with bladder stones. He's never had a kidney stone. He gets bladder stones and urethral stones to the point where he, his uh, urologist said he had 100,000 crystals in there and they couldn't put a scope in there. It was just all stones and it was really shredding his bladder and his urethra. He never died of sepsis. He'd been amazingly getting along with this, but now two years of doing what I told him to do with the diet and getting off the sea and taking lemon juice and minerals. And now he's down to like two or three stones in the bladder. He feels great. He's, he's in his early seventies. He's has a very active life. Um, and his doctor can't believe the transition, the transformation, but she would expect him. He should have kidney stones. He doesn't, he should have fibromyalgia. He doesn't, he should have headaches or an autoimmune disease. And his is mostly this bladder problem. And yet, you know, we can reverse fibrotic diseases, autoimmune diseases, uh, liver problems, our thyroid problems, you name it. It's like wherever oxalate kind of gets us in ways where we're specifically vulnerable, which is set up with our genetics and our background and our, what we've done in our lives and how we've used our body and what we've eaten and when and, and lots of mysterious factors that we don't understand. But that nobody does well on a diet that's routinely taking in more oxalate than the body can really manage, more than the kidneys can manage, more than the vascular system can manage. Sally, um, I want them to understand it better. What actually are the most common manifestation of, of um, oxalate toxicity? Because I, I learned from you also, based on your on site, that there are these organs that are mostly affected, which are most common to other people, which is the blood, the skin. So the rashes and other um, manifest manifestation could be on the skin and also the bone. And you also uh, said a while ago, the calcifi um, calcified arteries, which people 
uh, might not knew about because they think calcified arteries are just because of fat. That's how we were taught. Uh, but then you have hypertension and then your doctor would tell you your arteries are calcified, not knowing that it's not just about the fat, but you're, you might be consuming foods that may make or may put your arteries into high risk of being calcified, like oxalate-rich foods. So what could be some of the diseases you could list down or you could actually tell people so that um, because they will get overwhelmed, they have never heard of oxalate before. Right. And that's why we want to help them out. So, so what could be yeah. the manifestations? And and I, since I just want to follow on that calcium comment too, because I assume the Filipino diet does not have dairy foods much in it. And so it's hard to get a lot of calcium from foods and without doing bones and fish bones and so on. So if you're not using bones a lot, just a low calcium intake will make you more and more vulnerable to the oxalate that's in the okra and the spinach and the almonds are ridiculous. Um, so calcium is really a critical piece of this. Now, the, the symptoms, I, the areas that tend to really get into accumulation with oxalate, like you said, the kidneys, the digestive tract is harmed by it, the vascular system, but eyes are really commonplace. I would say the glands around the eyes and the various eye tissues, both the lens can get cloudy, the macula gets damaged, the retina gets damaged. So you can have vision problems, you can have dry eyes, you can have wet eyes, you, you can have gritty eyes in the morning. You'll notice this as part of dumping. You'll see grit um, in the morning most likely and sometimes so much that it kind of glues your eyes together or you'll get dried stuff on the cheeks and so on. That could be from the oxalates clearing from the eyes. And I'm beginning to think that the nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain will sometimes push oxalate toward the eyes as if it's the surface way to excrete things. It makes sense because there's a lot of glands around the eyes and a lot of activity, a lot of blood flow. And so there's um, maybe a kind of an energetic push in that way. I've never read that, but that seems to be what's happening with this long-term oxalate clearing where you've got a lot of oxalate in the bones of the spine, which mm -hmm. comes later and you 10 years later, you can still be clearing oxalate from the bones of the spine and sometimes still see eye styes as a sign of dumping. Now, when the blood level goes up in oxalate after meals, but when you go low oxalate into a carnivore diet and the body starts removing oxalate from your bones and your sinuses and <clears throat> wherever it's hanging out, that it puts it back into the blood often. Although, as you said, some people get rashes and will literally push it out yes. of their skin. So there's three ways to push it out. Fundamentally is, the urine is the key one. Then the colon will turn on exc excretors and try to remove oxalate, especially when the metabolism is acidic or when the kidneys are stressed. That is two features that help to turn on this excretion into the colon. So you can get gritty stools where you get hemorrhoids or um, burning rectal area and just some real discomfort and um, swings in the textures and colors and consistency of the stools. And we'll see stuff coming out, biofilms and temporary changes where the gallbladder seems to be not working for a little while. That's really typical because the sludge in the gall, mm -hmm. um, the bile ducts of the gallstone area, that sludge can be full of oxalate. And it seems to be a stage people go through where they're clearing oxalates where they stop having good um, fat digestion and the gallbladder. So you get yellow floaty stools, greasy stools. That's all part of the healing process. But you'll also notice in addition to the cloudy urine or the grit in the teeth, additional tartar forming in the teeth. Because when the blood levels are higher, you get more oxalate in the tartar because the saliva glands will concentrate oxalate 10 or 40 times more than um, the, the level of the blood. So you, you'll get, that's another sign. If you get additional tartar forming in the teeth, and if you don't get the cloudy urine, but you're getting the tarty, tartar or you're getting the grit, you, you may be having trouble getting it. Your kidneys may be having trouble getting it out. So not everybody gets the cloudy urine because another thing is much of the oxalate is oxalic acid can be excreted as an acid ion that doesn't, isn't crystallizing. If you have a lot of magnesium, a lot of citrate, a lot of proteins, in the urine, it, it lowers the crystallizing. It has to crystallize in big enough molecules so that the light bounces and you see the cloudy urine. So 
no cloudy urine doesn't mean you're not excreting oxalate. It can, you can have clear urine and still be excreting oxalate. But those three areas like the eye grit, the tartar and the cloudy urine are things to ask about, think about, oh, that's a sign that the, you're having a wave of oxalate clearing or you've been eating too many oxalate foods recently. But so there's the, also the, the grit in the colon, the changes in the colon function. Some people will get bouts of diarrhea or they'll get a paralysis or an obstruction like symptomology in the colon where they can't go at all or these rashes. Some people get heat rash without pain and itching, or they'll get really itchy rashes that can be kind of persistent for many, many months. And eventually it calms down. Some people, they get boils in the rashes and they're literally coming out of the rashes as this little white grit, little bits of like quartz-like stuff. Yes. I have had clients describe um, snow like dust coming off their skin for two years straight. Not the grit, but just really even more fine than that, where it's just a tremendous shedding. So when you go carnivore and you start not feeling well and you have these bouts of feeling even worse, you might see some of these other signs, which will reassure you that this is part of the body cleaning house. So that's not really so much about the symptoms that oxalate yes. causes, that's more about the dumping Yes. So the other symptoms that you get when you're sick with oxalate are, could be fatigue, could be mm -hmm. strange energy. Sleep problems are very common. And sometimes you could sleep so badly, you don't even know you're not sleeping well. You're just having trouble with your brain during the day. Your brain has low energy and you're having trouble thinking and remembering. That could be a sign that you're not sleeping well because of the neurotoxicity. Forms of neuropathies and pains, fibromyalgia, arthritis, uh, back pain, neck pain is really common, knots in the muscles behind the, the shoulder blades and frozen shoulder, uh, tricky feet. Let's see, autoimmune issues where you feel like you must have some kind of uh, thyroid problems where you need some thyroid medication, endometriosis, low um, trouble with blood sugar regulation because oxalate's affecting your ability to do gluconeogenesis. And you can mm -hmm. have trouble with low blood sugar. You can have trouble with insulin resistance. You can have trouble with muscle glycogen and glycogen conversion and so on because oxalate is sitting on enzymes. You could have hemolymic anemia because oxalate will sit on an enzyme that allows you to produce ATP and red blood cells and block that. So you could be low enough in energy in your red blood cells that you have blood cells that are exploding because the sodium is getting stuck inside the cell. So it's just like an endless list of problems. Yes. <laughs> and so it involves your connective tissues, your nervous system, and your immune system. So the other set of symptoms that are common with this is chronic sinus infection or chronic UTIs or chronic yeast infections. Um, uh, even limes and things like that, like weird chronic, you try to treat them with antifungals or antibacterials and they come back and come back and come back and come back. You try to teach them with natural stuff, doesn't really do it. But once you get oxalate out of the way, you quit damaging your immune system every time you eat and now your immune system can handle those infections better. And we correct the acidity that goes with all that immune system damage with minerals and, and citrate and voila, you get rid of your sinus infection, you get rid of your chronic UTIs, your chronic yeast infections. And so that, that's another set, set of problems that is, could be a telltale sign that you are consuming too much oxalate. So oh, one of the, uh, one patient I had before is that uh, he, she has sleeping disorder, not disorder, but sleeping problem. And she understands that when you go keto, you should have one mental clarity and improve sleep but she cannot get uh, with uh, she cannot get that result so maybe this is one of the reason why uh, maybe she's also eating a lot of oxalate rich food and last night there are also people um, commenting about keto side effects were in some of them even though they're already keto adapted they're all already fat fueled which should make them improve their sleep and their cognitive and and mood issues 
it's still worsening. So at least now, uh, the link that they're looking for is here. So guys, it could be oxalate. You need to review what you're eating the past few weeks, the past few months, or even when you started doing the, the keto diet, the low-carb diet, and the carnivore. And that is one also of the main observation I get, that when people do the low-carb and keto, and they cannot get the result they want, especially with cognitive um, and mood and sleep issues, they go carnivore and they felt better. So they mu it must not just be the carnivore, but simply eliminating something they do not know <laughs> that must be damaging their health. So that's the reason why my husband as well, because he's also a nutritionist dietitian here in the Philippines before he became a doctor. And this, everything is actually very new to him. But when he started doing carnivore seven months ago, he felt better. And he doesn't know why. He, can, he, he, he actually can figure out before why. But he felt better and he continued doing the carnivore up until now. So it must be the, the anti-nutrients. And at least now we understand because on my point of view, when I learned about oxalate, um, I did not went full carnivore, but I just became more observant of plants that I eat, whether it's low oxalate or high oxalate. So now people are actually waiting about the list that we could give them. What are high oxalate uh, rich foods? Um, the most common list. Well, um, nowadays people are using chia seed as food and having like chia bowls. Yes. That's terrible. <laughs> oh my God, I can relate to that. I, I'm, I'm, um, we are fond of drinking milk tea, especially during the pandemic here in the Philippines. Also, when all the keto community um, do the keto fight or the keto version of milk tea, they, they use the chia seed as the boba, the, the pearl. Yeah. So everyone is actually doing the chia pudding, chia everything. And I am one of them. And when I learned about oxalate, oh my God, I, I ditch, I totally ditch the chia seeds as well. <laughs> yeah, chia is strange how everybody's picked that up and they're using it. Poppy seed isn't good either. Hemp is not great. Sesame seeds aren't great either. Um, but you can have pumpkin seeds. Those are low. Some mm -hmm. sunflower seeds and flax seeds and coconut is low. Um, so, you know, you can use coconut where you might have used almonds and almond milk and you can use coconut, to, you know, coconut's a common ingredient. You guys know how to work with coconut milk and so on, right? So yeah, it's, it's, just a, it's a pretty good food to have around because uh, it's so versatile and you can do a lot of things with it. So, yeah, the chia is not so good. And the vegetables, we talked about spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, okra, sugar snap peas are kind of high. Uh, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, carrots, and you don't use cactus, I don't think, do you? Mm. There, but yeah, cactus would be terrible. Uh, in the fruits, it's blackberry, elderberries, figs, um, olives if you use too much, kiwi, some oh, plantain. I don't know if you guys use plantain there. Pomegranate, which is popular as like an anti-inflammatory food, is pretty high in oxalate. Raspberries, rhubarb, we probably don't use that. Star fruit is mm -hmm. a terrible one. That one, there's lots of write-ups in the literature. It's all through Brazil and several Asian countries. They love star fruit as like a health yes. food. <laughs> when I was young, I used to I used to binge with star fruits in our province. <laughs> oh yeah, they're they're scary bad, uh, like rhubarb is. And then some beans, black beans, pinto beans, soybeans tend to be pretty high. Um, the soy varies a lot. Like the soy we grow here and use for tofu are lower in oxalate than the soybeans they use for other things. But as a general rule, soy is a problem ingredient. And as a nutritionist, I'm not in favor of using soy, but it is also because it's high in oxalate. Some of the white beans that we use here, Great Northern and... Um, forget the other ones, but they use them for like the Boston baked bean here and so on. They're really high oxalate, but you can use uh, pea type beans like yeah. black eyed peas and chickpeas. My favorite. <laughs> yeah. And so they're in green peas. They're much lower in oxalate. So that would be 
a transition food, there's, you know, they have some starch in it. So if you're going low carb, you tend to like not bother with them. But some of us mm -hmm. who are so damaged with oxalate can't stay deeply keto, like strict, strict carnivore style, zero carb dieting is stressful and not necessarily maintainable every day of the week for many years. It's really too hard on us because our gluconeogenesis isn't where it should be. We have trouble sleeping on a, a zero carb eating doesn't mm -hmm. work for everybody. So it's really important to people, yes. like, you know, you gotta work with your metabolism, especially women, you know, don't overstress your cortisol and your adrenal glands and your thyroid gland by trying to be zero carb too long. So some of these things, like the green peas and so on might be good foods to have around that have a little bit of oxalate, but not a lot. And so you might get enough oxalate and enough carbs so that you're not dumping too fast and you're sleeping better. And it's amazing what we could do with the small little choices. So now there's all these like pseudo grains that people are into, mm -hmm. the amaranth, the buckwheat, the teff and the quinoa, terribly high oxalate. Yes. So quinoa is like this thing now because it's got yes. amino acids in it. Terrible. Saponin's in there that helps like dissolve. It's a soap molecule in quinoa that helps dissolve the membranes of your cells and lets oxalate get in even better. Quinoa is bad news. Um, mm -hmm. And then like the, the rye breads, the dark pumpernickel style rye breads are high on oxalate. Then the potato, chocolate, plantain, in the tea, you can overdo tea, but if you're getting rid of the other foods like the spinach and cashews, a cup of tea is okay. But um, on top of everything else, it's just more oxalate. And then there's a few spices like turmeric that are really high yes. in oxalate. Oh, they're, that is one of their favorite here in the Philippines, turmeric tea. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. So you can use curcumin extract if you love the flavor of the turmeric. And in some space cases, you could use essential oil of like cumin and some of these that are high black pepper but if you use white pepper is a low oxalate spice and mm -hmm. and cayenne pepper is a low oxalate spice so you can get some real flavors going um even if you're being careful enough to also sort of curate your herbs as well yeah i i also switch from black pepper to white pepper and i i learned a lot from you uh, on your site just on your site alone i have already learned uh, a lot how about ginger they're asking about ginger, ginger <laughs> no, that, that's like a, our mm -mm, that's it's a little high you know so you gotta be not you like using pounds and pounds of it but if you boil it as if you're making crystallized ginger you can get rid of a lot of the oxalate so i i just use crystallized ginger to make like my baked apples and things mm -hmm. like that um, and you, we like crystallized ginger as a snack in this house. And if you've already gotten rid of the almonds and the chocolate and all that stuff, some ginger is fine. You know, mm -hmm. sort of the context, like if you add ginger on top of eating some kind of almond thing or like a pudding with cacao and almond, then, then you don't need anything else. Don't eat ginger. But if you're otherwise doing like carnivore and using ginger as a seasoning, it's fine. Uh, yeah. But I, in our house, we generally like to use the crystallized ginger because you boil it for like an hour and throw yes. out the water. And so you're removing a lot of the oxalate. Yeah, Filipino loves ginger, uh, boiled ginger. It's like um, they incorporate it with their tea. They incorporate it with honey. They incorporate it with lemon. So that's how they use ginger here as well. Uh, that's why they're asking you about it because you said that their merit is bad. So they kind of think, Oh no, ginger. What about too. ginger? <laughs> yeah, I love ginger too. And um, it, if you if you boil it once and throw out the water, you can still get ginger flavor out of it without yes. as much oxalate in it. Mm -hmm. Eggplants, because this is one of their favorites here in the Philippines. Eggplants are, are on the high side too. It is one of those high oxalate foods, so, and, and so if you're turning it into like the main part of your dish and making like a yes, dish, then it may be too much. <laughs> So, and they vary a lot and we haven't had the testing. So what you purchase to cook at home has never been tested, right? Mm. We've only tested a couple handfuls of eggplants. There's many, like probably a hundred kinds of eggplant, different sizes and shapes and colors and yeah. ripeness and different soils. And, it, you know, like an apple might be different if it's grown in Egypt versus in Washington state, America. Exactly. Like, so there's so many factors 
And eggplant is, you know, it's a nightshade, it's high in lectins, it has seeds, it has oxalate. So if you're sick, probably you'd be better off with thinking more like a carnivore and thinking maybe I should mm. use eggplant as a seasoning around the edges of a meat-based meal. Um, yeah, don't don't turn eggplant into the meat in the dish. Like <laughs> <laughs> This is one of our staples here. Um, we yeah. used to mix it with scrambled eggs. That's how we love to eat eggplants here in the Philippines. And we we kind of um, use eggplant in many Filipino dishes like boiled um, boiled and soured uh, meats. We put eggplants in fish uh, dishes, especially with with soup. We put eggplant. So that's how we love eggplants. That, that's the reason why we, we need more testing to find out, you know, if we could understand eggplants more and and how well how much oxalate is there, how many other anti-nutrients, how much they're affecting our health or not. I wish we knew more about them, but they're generally high in oxalate. The small amounts of hot pepper is the same family, not so bad. Certain amounts of fresh tomato is fine, but you know, and some people that make this concentrated tomato sauce and use it everywhere. Yes. Like and spaghettis and these kinds of sort of, sort of Italian type foods. And it's too much, too much. You concentrate it and it's too much. And so eggplant is one of those things you can, shrink it down, salt it, you know, kind of make it denser and dried out more and you can end up eating a lot of it. So uh, there's, it, yeah. As, yeah, you may continue. Well, no, I think it's, Hello. Variety that's lower in oxalate than others, but we don't have enough testing to know. It'd be nice yes. to have a lot of money. You'd have to test each, let's say there's a hundred kinds of eggplant. We'd have to test each one every year for three years to see how variable it is based on the weather or whatever and different soil types and different ripenesses and sizes and how long since it was picked. And there's like all kinds of factors that might affect how much oxalate is in there. So I would say try not to depend on eggplant every day and not in giant amounts because it's one of those sort of toxic like foods a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting question here regarding the food intolerance and food allergies test. Um, can we know if we have intolerance with oxalate when we do the, the food allergy test being done by many institutions? No, but a lot of us who have oxalate problems have all these sensitivities to foods. Mm. They'll show up different patterns and different food intolerance tests in the we know we're reacting to some foods and then different ones show up on these tests. And you were, a lot of us have re, end up in carnivore because we start saying, oh, we can't have wheat, we can't have this, we can't have that. And that's part of the pattern, I think, with the gut damage and the immune system damage where we start being sensitive to things. But there is no good test that's a blood type test mm. or even a test it's telling us. Because oh. this is the question. Um, Mamling Marapao had this food intolerance test because it's actually going on here. Uh, there are institutions that offers this one where they will give you the list on which foods you are intolerant with. And um, she kind of have a problem because she have this um, intolerance with some nuts and vegetables that you mentioned, but those did not occur on the list that they gave her. And she's still experiencing... Uh, some symptoms of sensitivity and intolerance to those. So at least now That's we... my case too, where I'm allergic to the low oxalate foods. Mm, like yeah. the low oxalate vegetables are the cabbage family vegetables. There's many kinds of cabbage family vegetables and I'm allergic to most of them. No. Yes. Same. <laughs> that's that's a common dilemma. That's one reason why the carnivore diet is helpful because it, it is an elimination diet that really simplifies this kind of reactivity. Um, and it can be fun. I mean, it can be fun if you have access to good meats and you know how to cook them. And yes, we have lots of of um, what is this grass fed beefs here in the Philippines, but they're just not nice. as tender as what you have there. <laughs> but I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, it's good to have a lot of money. Yes, but if you don't, one one thing I always try to tell them if you don't have enough funds to test or anything you could do the carnivore diet 
like what I did for a time being, if you want to reintroduce food. Because if you cannot find uh, what reasons or what foods are causing your pain or your your um, manifestations, your signs and symptoms, you could actually do the carnivore diet and and eliminate all those foods and try to reintroduce them so that you will know and you can pinpoint what food causes your um, symptoms. So if you don't have money, what can you do? You just need to do it by yourself, do the elimination diet, and reintroduce them again. So yeah. to some people, they can have access to a lot of testing, but some just the testing don't. is a really equivocal. It doesn't. It's yeah. not always accurate. We don't really know how accurate these allergy tests are, and they're very pricey. So. To, I generally tell people, save your money on tests. Let's just work with your diet. You, you save, yes. you spend money with someone who can hear your symptoms and help coach you on how to do rotational diets and help you understand, well, those symptoms aren't an allergy. That's oxalate clearing happening. So you may be misattributing, oh, it's this food, but it may be just these are you're going through oxalate clearing symptoms. So if you spend a few hundred dollars working with someone who actually knows what they're doing, you might get more out of that than you would at spending thousands on these tests. So Thank I, you I for mentioning that. Oxalates and testing, you know, it's you can waste a lot of money there when you should be putting the money into the grocery cart and into good coaching or, or something like that. Yeah. So, so we should talk a little bit about cancer too, before we're done, because you're dealing with the breast cancer and oxalate yes. connection with cancer is really interesting. So someone's asking about the oat test um, is better. Yes. Yeah, so the oat test can catch the moments when your oxalate level is high, but urine is naturally variable. And so mm -hmm. the oat tests, like all urine tests are prone to what we call a false negative, where you might take that urine sample uh, at a moment or a day when your level of oxalate excretion is low. The body is regulating in the background how much you can excrete. And so if it says it's low, it doesn't mean you're low in oxalate. It doesn't get you off the hook. You might still have an oxalate problem. In fact, the more damaged your kidneys are, the less oxalate they can remove. So if you're really an end-stage renal or heading towards serious renal problems, you won't see much oxalate in the urine. It'll look normal or low normal. And you think, oh, that's not oxalate. Oh yeah. The oxalates have ruined your kidneys to the point where now it's sticking. This the it's the oxalate starts sticking in the kidneys is to become like a magnet and it can't get out. So that would be terrible if you had, and then you need a scan. You can, it, at that point, when you have that much calcinosis happening in the kidney tissues, a ultrasound will usually pick up that you've got calcified kidneys and that could be why it's low. But generally, um, one study, for example, demonstrated that you needed to take nine urine samples to guess at the average amount of oxalate in the urine. Mm. Nine urine samples. No doctor is going to order nine tests. Yes. <laughs> if you get one high test, that's enough. But if you mm. get one or two low tests, that's not enough. That doesn't really prove that you don't have an oxalate problem. Okay. So, yes, our last topic, I'm happy that you, you brought that up again, cancer. Yes, I'm dealing with breast cancer. I was diagnosed last month. I thought I was never going to be able to do this interview, but, you know, it's it's one of the miracle that happens. We still have the chance to do this because my operation was deferred last week. So we are here. And what can you advise and how can oxalate also be a a concern, especially for people who have cancer like me? Well, oxalate is probably a major um, contributor to cancers, which is really interesting because it shows up as like these other steps in between help to bleed. There's a direct, there's one study, only one that shows direct exposure of breast cells to oxalate creates cancer cells. And it often, I think, doesn't necessarily lead to ox to cancer in that direct way because Oxalate is also so toxic that it kills the cancer cells. So it creates cancer cells and then kills the cells. But in the chronic exposure to oxalate, you end up with higher levels of other compounds and you end up with higher levels of acidity. And too much metabolic acidity can lead to cancer problems. And um, this other molecule that I'm thinking about is called osteopontin. And the kidneys make a lot of osteopontin and other proteins 
when you have high oxalate to prevent kidney stones. So it puts out these proteins which are attracted to the calcium oxalate and they stick and now you can't build a stone because there's all these proteins in the way. And that's probably also, that can contribute to foamy looking urine, kind of like beaten egg whites. You get foamy urine from extra albumin and many, many other proteins that the kidneys will make. And so when you have high osteopotin, this leads to cancer mm. chronically. It leads to fibromyalgia. And it explains why people who get kidney stones from a high oxalate diet don't get the fibromyalgia, but the people who don't get kidney stones from a high oxalate diet tend to get the fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. Because their kidneys are so good at not getting kidney stones that they have high osteopontin chronically, which becomes really toxic to the body. It's a good compound when it's supposed to be there, but you're not supposed to have it all the time. But if you're like me and eating sweet potatoes every day, you get fibromyalgia and cancer. And these are, so you got these other changes in your metabolism where you get stressed metabolism throughout the body. And this can become cancers, especially breast cancer, because this, the breasts are prone to picking up oxalate because they concentrate calcium to make breast milk. So they have good, the cells in the breast are good at moving calcium around because they're supposed to make calcium milk. And I think that ends up being a vulnerability for them to attract deposits of oxalate in the breast tissue. And my experience has been the people who've gotten cancer, breast cancer, after they've learned to be low oxalate, then they get, the, then the cancer shows up, but they do really well in treatment. And especially when they know to eat enough meat and correct the acidity in the body, they do great. So they, they don't get into chronic life-threatening cancer in the long term. They, they do better. I think anybody with any disease should not be eating a lot of poisons, especially oxalate. And cancer is a great example of that where you could be getting cancer because of the high oxalate diet as part of the, one of the major toxins that's contributing to this. And then interfering, I think, with response to treatment, if you're still eating high oxalate while you're having cancer. Yeah. Wow, so, what a great preparation. No, <laughs> what a great preparation for my therapy. So I will be having my surgery and I've been on keto carnivore and low oxalate diet since the since January of 2022, this year. So I, I guess maybe God had prepared me a lot for this battle. <laughs> and thank you so much. For the last question, um, Sally, how can we transition from high oxalate to low oxalate without really experiencing a lot oxalate dumping symptom? Because that that is one of the main reasons why people just stop doing transitions or or stop doing the diet because they think it's a very bad effect. Yeah, you really don't want to have your body spilling a lot of oxalate all at once. It is toxic. It's a dose thing. And you don't really want to have your body suddenly unburdening itself too quickly. And if you go from eating these, these keto foods, like the chia pudding and the almond everything, the milk and the bread and the spinach, and then you just cut them out suddenly because you learn, oh, oxalates are bad. I want to try carnivore. That is an abrupt message, a very strong message. Oh, high oxalate, now you go off for only a week and that teaches the body, ah, we're in the season of no oxalate. Here comes what I call winter time. Because I think historically, before these modern patterns of eating the same all year round, you would have a period every year where you didn't eat high oxalate foods at all and you would clean out and the body would do it quickly and that would be okay because it was only one year's worth of accumulation. But now it's a lifetime and it's really high levels because we're eating these odd foods like the chia and the, the almonds. So yeah, you want to like know enough about where the oxalates have been in your diet and not get rid of them all. So keep the ginger, you know, and keep some medium oxalate foods. It only takes some um, two big spoons of sweet potato and that's enough oxalate to help you not dump. Um, you could keep a little bit of chocolate as a little bit of an oxalate dose because by eating a little bit of oxalate, that tells the body, can't do it, it's not, it's not winter. I call it winter when you're not eating oxalate, right? When you just live on the fish and the meat because there's no plants in winter. Mm -hmm. So when you go carnivore, that's a winter diet, Tell, no, no, tell the body, no, it's not winter. Here's a little tiny 
bite of something like a little bit of well some carrots use carrots um, for example they're low enough you can have a cup of carrots in a dish a little bit of eggplant um, these are good things to have a little bit of green peas and uh, small amounts of some of the higher things even you can have some beets things like that a couple bits of chocolate small amounts some tea so you mm -hmm. keep those around in your diet and you keep we, we, i tell people They'll, and I'll have data available on my website in the oh. next two months because I've been working hard on the database and getting the data right and making it readable. So in that, yes. support, in that support tab up there, in there, there's a shop page and, and in there, there'll be a, a database available and more. Mm. Products. And, but you can get the my um, like beginner's guide that has a list of high foods and low foods. And this is usually enough. It just yes. you don't have to be perfect you know like leave a few things in your diet in small amounts even a couple teaspoons of peanut butter you can use some of that to make that's available stuff. here as well yeah yeah you can just download okay. this as a pdf you can because, get it as a, because as the a, one i had was your i i downloaded your oxalate uh, guide the that's PDF the beginner's one. guide yeah, yeah so the beginner's, the beginner's guide. guide has this on one of the pages of it oh, mm -hmm. so the, the, this is a old version that was a card it's a heavy duty card that's smaller than the beginner's guide and and i'm gonna um do a couple little updates but it's not none of the data none of the information has changed really so that that's enough really and just be fine keep some tea in your diet a couple little bits of chocolate you're like little bits around the edges will lower this tendency for the body to kind of make itself sick Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes what's really causing the problem is the low calcium and the low minerals. And then you start taking calcium, magnesium, a little potassium, and this can help a lot. I have a client, we just spoke last night from Australia, and she just started taking a teaspoon of calcium citrate three times a day with her meals. And lo and behold, many, many bad symptoms that had been really disturbing her for five years just started going away. Because she has been on a low calcium diet and she, for a long time and was vegetarian for a long time. And she's so depleted. A lot of her symptoms are coming from this mineral depletion side. So we really have to add in the minerals, tiny bits of oxalate around the edges, some ways to keep the acidity down with some lemon juice or some of these citrate molecules. And wow, you can feel pretty good. Thank you so much. Um, it It is a very brief but also a comprehensive type wherein i guess it could be used for starters who want to really learn about the toxicity of oxalate and for those who cannot understand why they still have these bad symptoms despite of um you know uh, doing all the good things that low carb has taught us so you are also i i would love to also present them that you are going to release your book so I, there are lots of people here who loves to buy book in Amazon, and maybe this could be one of their least. It will be out on December, right? That's right. So this is your this is your first book. The first book, yes. It's taken a lot of effort to get this thing done. It's covering a lot of a whole bit of the background about why we think these foods are healthy and they're really not. Why medicine is missing this topic and why we're confused and. And this covers a whole lot of the history and the basics, plus a whole lot of how to explains the dumping and lots of little stories from people, lots of research. So if you like the details of research, that's there. So there's something for everyone in that book. I'm, I wanted to be able to help both doctors who want to learn this to help patients and patients who are just helping themselves and their family members. So yeah, we're holding it for right at the end of December because the health media tends to get excited about health topics in January. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I saw you when you announced that you'll be releasing a book and I thought it was early this year. And when I saw in Amazon that it was going to release on December, I was like, oh my God, it, it, it well, will take me too long. To... <laughs> they, originally, they were thinking we would get it out April. Oh, okay. and, and then it was going to be August. And then the marketing department said, let's wait until December. So that gives <laughs> yeah. us more time, more time to encourage people to pre-order the book, make sure enough get made up and get people a chance to like be ready to, to put out some nice, um, if you find the book really helpful for you, 
say so online so that more and more people will find it because that helps the, you know, the algorithms and Amazon and so on will offer book ideas if a book is getting attention. So if, if online we can give the book some, some love that will help other people discover this topic, which is hidden to a lot of us. So we go too many years thinking mm. beets are healthy and spinach is healthy and almonds are good and don't know that there's a dark side to that. And it's unfortunate because you can injure your children unnecessarily. It's very dangerous to be feeding these foods to your children. So the more we can help others become aware, the more we can prevent suffering. Yes, I already pre-ordered it on my Kindle account <laughs> because it's the easiest way for me and I can always carry them around with my with my pad. So yes, guys, you can there are many people asking how to order. This is available on Amazon. Um, depending on your preference, you could have the physical book, uh, you can have audio. I think it's also available on audio as well. Yeah. And right. also in Kindle. So if you love to collect books on your Kindle so that you can just uh, pick whatever book you want to read that day, if you're like me, <laughs> depending on your mood. So you can always have this book around you with your um, pad or tab. So thank you so much, Sally, for today. Thank you so much for allowing us to experience and learn from you. Um, this, is, this means so much to us and especially for me because I... I just took a chance to reach out and I'm so happy that you accommodated and you really um, went for this schedule. And thank you so much. The The whole Filipino low-carb carnivore keto community is very happy to see you right now and very thankful of all the learnings that you have given us and the knowledge. And we will surely use this, and especially me and Mike, <laughs> we will really use this in our patient care. This will improve a lot of how we handle patients and i hope that some of the health practitioners who are with us right now because we have lots of doctors now here who are also practicing more holistic care in their patient will learn a lot from this so for for some people who are who um came in late uh, don't worry we i will not um delete this video so you can just replay um watch it again whenever you want to revisit and review other things that sally have taught us thank you so much sally. well you know it's really an honor to meet a pioneer like yourself you're you're showing a lot of leadership in what you're doing and you, obviously your followers are already in love with the work you're doing and you've got the you know the good sense to recognize a good topic and you know personal experience means a lot to all of us and to, to have this opportunity to work together i'm grateful for that i'm looking forward to supporting you in your healing journey and in your leadership that you're doing there and it's a great honor to get to be part of your educational mission so keep up the good work counting Thank on you being so healthy hopefully you'll be get all the best care you can and you'll bounce back from this little bump in the road you've got to deal with now but <laughs> yes thank you you're gonna come out beautifully fine yeah thank you so this is uh, a very very great sunday morning for all of us here in the philippines and a good night to miss sally norton in the united states so guys thank you so much for tuning in thank you so much for watching tonight i will still be having a live stream for our last part of the low carb beginner to uh, 2022 guide so i'm actually lecturing them free sessions to to add for the advocacy before i get to treat myself for my cancer journey <laughs> so this is like a, a way of paying back the community that has helped me a lot and mm -hmm. um experience my growth as a physician as well so thank you so much guys for watching and thank you so much Hattie. <laughs> bye